All right, so um, hope you enjoyed that wonderful movie. Um, the the um, most interesting thing to me, I was talking to some other people about this a minute ago, about this movie is two of the six or seven evolutionary biologists they feature in this, the Wayne Madison and Tandy Warnow, have identical twin siblings who also work on phylogenetics. Um, so it's two, two of those seven have identical twins. Uh, kind of hard to interact with them at conferences because you never they work on very similar things and you never know which one you're talking to. But don't, don't tell them I said that. Um, all right, so what we want to do um, now, that movie was sort of to give you the big picture perspective on many of the things we're talking about and give just a little visual representation of them. Um, and what we're going to do now is talk about character traits and states. So the features of organisms overlaid onto a tree, sort of akin to the colors of the bunnies in that glorious bunny evolution uh, situation there. Um, so the first thing we need to do is define a couple of terms. So a character, as we use it here, is any heritable feature of an organism. So it's very important that the feature that we're talking about when we use the term character is is heritable, that is, it is transmitted from parent to offspring. And sometimes those will be, will be referred to as character traits or just traits. So it's sort of three different ways to refer to the same thing. And then characters can come in different forms. And those are called character states. That is the particular form a character takes. An example is given on this slide, and we'll see many other examples. It could be the color of the bunny, but the one I have here is the heart. So the character itself, the heritable feature of organisms is the heart. The character state can be presence or absence. So in many cases, we will be tracing the evolution of a particular character, and we will be looking at, at in essence, the gain of that character or the loss of that character. So the character state in that case is presence or absence. But in many cases, we will be talking about different forms that that character takes when present. So the number of chambers of the heart, for example. So again, the character state is the, num the different forms. The character trait is the feature itself. So what we need to do is now map characters onto a tree. So we're going to assume we know the phylogenetic tree. We're going to use this same tree we've been using for other things so far in the class. And we're going to assume we know the history of the character and the character states. And we're just going to trace its evolution on this tree so that you see how we represent character evolution on a tree. So imagine we have a character that is the presence of a face. And the character state is the smiley face. And for this particular scenario, we're showing the character at the most recent common ancestor of this entire group and the character state, which is smiley. And then we're just coloring, showing on the branches here what the character state is for the population. And for this particular scenario, there's been no change in the character state over the evolution of this group of organisms. So this is really important for you to wrap your brains around. When you sh show a phylogenetic tree, that is not representing the change that is occurring for any characters. It's just representing the history of branching patterns. Like in the bunny video, the splits that occur due to the river or the volcano. And not anything to do with whether or not features change in that organism. So here we have a group of organisms, and this particular character state has not changed at all for this group. This is kind of a, an excessive representation. Frequently, we have simplified ways to represent this. We can color the branches with a particular color to represent what we think the trait was, the character state at different times in the evolution of this group of organisms. We can throw away the representation at the nodes. We're now just showing everything by color. 
And so they, you will see many different of these sort of simplified views of representing character states mapped onto a tree of organisms. Any character like this that is inherited from a common ancestor, so the smiley faces in all of these organisms in this tree, characters that are inherited from a common ancestor are called homologous. And homology, the term that you will hear throughout the course, is a, something that is due to common ancestry. So that's sort of the simple trait. The state never changes for a particular trait. Of course, states do change, again, like the color with the bunny, but for all sorts of other features as you are doing for the lab exercises or if you've done the lab already. And when the features change of an organism over time, that's called divergence or divergent evolution. And you should have learned a reasonable amount about this in BIS 2A and 2B. So how do populations change over time like they tried to represent with the bunny? Well, you can have a new mutation change the DNA for a particular organism, and that can spread into the population and eventually spread into the entire population and take over. You can have recombination between different individuals creating new, form, new forms. You can have selection that drives some of this within a population. We're not going to go into any of the details here on the mechanisms by which features change in a population. We're assuming you already know this. We're just going to now map those state changes onto the phylogeny of organisms. So let's show what that looks like. Again, assuming we know the entire history for a particular character and the state changes that might occur. We're starting with the smiley face and the um, most recent common ancestor again. And imagine there's some mutation and eventually that mutation takes over the population in this lineage over here to create the frowny face. And it's a character that is heritable. So the descendants, once the frowny face takes over the population, all of their descendants will inherit the frowny face. So again, we can simplify that by just showing the features at the nodes in the tree. We can use this coloring representation and even completely throw away the nodes. And now what we do in most cases is try and represent the character state change as you're doing in the lab by these tick marks on the branch in the tree. So when we think there's been a particular character state change, we can represent that by drawing a little tick mark on the branch where we think the character state change occurred. And then sometimes, although not always, you might even try and draw or represent the actual change in the character state next to that tick mark. Sometimes it's not shown. Sometimes there's a number used to refer to that particular change, and then there's a table listing what the trait changes are for particular numbers. But this is the representation that's commonly used for tracing character state changes along a tree. So something that's very important is to distinguish between ancestral state and derived state. So the ancestral state for a particular character, for a particular group of organisms, is the character state that was present in the common ancestor of that group. So this is relative for a particular group of organisms. When we say, what is the ancestral state for a group? We're talking about only that particular group of organisms and for that particular character and character state. So for this particular group of organisms, we have to distinguish between ancestral states, which were present in the common ancestor, and derived states. So a derived state is any state that is different from the state present in the common ancestor of that group that you are referring to. So it's really important to understand uh, these. 
So we're going to try, again, this is not to count for credit, but if you can get out your clickers, we want to make sure that this is working for most everybody in the class. And for those that it is not working for, we're going to have to talk to you afterwards. I'm going to start it up. It probably has not started yet. Um, and so which state is ancestral for this particular group for the character face? The smiley face, the frowny face, both or neither? Yeah, question. Um, do you just have to click the button down, or do you have to hit this button then right here that says send? You should, you should type the, the, the letter and then send. And then it should give you a little check mark if it was received. Oh, you don't have to press send. Never mind. I was always pressing send, so I guess I overdid it. Um, it's clearly coming in for most people because we have almost 300. Uh, all right, so um, I'm going to stop it. This is just for practice. Woohoo, everybody got it right, or almost everybody got it right. <laughs> if you didn't, we can talk about it later. Um, so the smiley face is the ancestral state for this particular character, for this particular group. If we zoomed out and there were lots of other organisms related to these organisms that had different features related to their face, it's possible that we would find that the ancestral state, if we went even further into the tree, might be some other feature. When we look at this, it is always relative to a particular group for a particular character in the character states that we're looking at. So we're going to shift now. We've, we've sort of talked about ancestral and derived states. We're going to talk about a very particular term that is used a lot in this course and a lot in the evolution literature, which relates specifically to derived states. And this term is synapomorphy. And first I'm going to show you sort of visually what it means and then give you a more specific definition, a verbal definition of it. So for monophyletic groups, which we talked about in the previous lecture, one of the reasons that we're interested in monophyletic groups is that they share features in common with each other to the exclusion of other organisms, other groups of organisms. And that's one of the reasons to identify monophyletic groups to study. The reason that they share features with each other to the exclusion of other organisms is that a monophyletic group, let's say A, B, and C, have a branch leading up to the common ancestor of that group that does not, no other organisms are derived from that branch. So if we're looking at this group, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, this branch here leading up to the common ancestor of A, B, and C is unique to A, B, and C. And if any features evolved on that branch, new features, derived features, evolved on that branch, and then they did not change in A, B, and C, they would be shared among A, B, and C, and not present in anything else. This, the existence of this unique branch for all monophyletic groups is really why we care about monophyletic groups. So you have you know, these two monophyletic groups. As we saw earlier, there are seven monophyletic groups for this entire group of organisms, but we're going to focus just on these two. Features that evolve on this branch leading up to the common ancestor of A, B, and C, where I'm representing by these tick marks, the numbers could correspond to just totally different traits with different character states being derived on these branches. So five different traits, five different origins of derived trait, derived states for those traits. Such features, when they are shared for a particular group and derived, that is, they evolved on this branch leading up to the common ancestor of that group, they're known as synapomorphies. Shared derived traits for a particular group are synapomorphies. In essence, they evolve on the branch leading up 
to the common ancestor of a particular group. Yeah, question. What if you drew a little black line to begin C? Here? So if there was a tick mark here, as there might be for other traits that I'm not showing here, that change, it would be a synapomorphy for A and B because it evolved on the branch leading up to the common ancestor of A and B. But it would not be a synapomorphy for A, B, and C because C would never have seen that change. Remember, there's time going from the past to the present on this tree. Anything that happens on this branch is only going to be shared by the descendants of that particular point in the tree. Does that make sense? Yeah, another question? Can you consider what? You cannot consider synapomorphies as an ancestral state for this particular situation. Now, a synapomorphy like these features, any of these traits that evolved on this branch, if we were only considering A, B, and C, if we erased the rest of the tree, that would then be the ancestral state for that group. So it's a little confusing. Synapomorphies are shared derived traits because they changed along this branch. But then they become the ancestral state for that particular group. So it's really important to realize that ancestral states and derived states are always relative to the particular group that you are looking at in a tree. So if we're talking about A, B, and C together, anything that was present in the common ancestor of A, B, and C is the ancestral state for that group. But synapomorphies is like this higher level concept. It's not about what is an ancestral state for A, B, and C. The term comes from this concept of shared derived traits. You can sort of ignore that part of the term and just remember that it is features that changed on the branch leading up to the common ancestor of a particular group. Yeah? All of the... Well, the way I've drawn it here without showing that there have been any other changes on this tree, so she asked, do all of them have these traits? The way I've shown it here, they all do. Because there was a change and I haven't drawn another tick mark to show that there was another change on the other branches. But synapomorphy is, again, this sort of higher level concept. Features that evolved on the branch leading up to the common ancestor of a particular group. We usually only use this term if it's present in most, if not all, of the members of that group. But biology is messy. There are exceptions to everything. So there are eyes could be considered, that the type of eyes we have could be considered uh, synapomorphy of animals. But there are cave crickets that have lost their eyes. Photosynthesis can be considered sort of a synapomorphy of green plants. But there are parasitic plants that have lost the ability to photosynthesize. So you really have to focus on major features that evolve on the branch leading up to the common ancestor of a particular group and then not lost by most of the members of that group or not changed. So it's a little nebulous. You've got to get used to that because biology is messy. We will not ask you about cases where we're going to try and trick you about a synapomorphy. We're going to try and use synapomorphies to refer to things present in most everything in a particular group. Any other questions about that? So the, the term synapomorphy, the reason I sort of emphasize this shared derived part of the term is if you, if you know any Greek, which I know virtually none, or if you like sort of learning the roots of words to help you understand the terms, that's where this syn, apo, morphe term comes from. So syn refers to, it means with, that's the shared part of the term. Apo, in essence, means away. That's the derived part of the term. And morphe is just a feature, a trait or character state, really the shape. And so again, it's important to really realize that synapomorphies are 
features that change along the branch leading up to the common ancestor of a particular group and can be considered hallmark features of that group. So in this case, we have a synapomorphy for this group over here is the frowny face. There was a change from smiley to frowny on the branch leading up to the common ancestor of this group. So now for a real, wor real world example, the reason we really care about these things is that once we define monophyletic groups and clades in a tree, it's very useful to then look for synapomorphy shared by members of that group because those can be features that we, you would then use to define that group and even to identify new members. If you have a new organism and you want to rapidly tell what type of organism it is, look for the synapomorphies for different groups. So there are multiple synapomorphies that characterize mammals, for example. That is, traits that evolved on this branch leading up to the common ancestor of mammals. Things like hair, milk, mammary glands, four-chambered heart, etc. So these are big features that evolved and changed along the branch leading up to the common ancestor of that group. That's why we care about synapomorphies. And that's why we care about monophyletic groups in many cases. There are plenty of synapomorphies for many of the groups that we will talk about in the class. Occasionally, we will talk about how people thought that the phylogeny looked like this, but they were always vexed because they couldn't find any synapomorphies for this group. And then it turns out that the phylogeny that they were using was wrong. So you will hear many examples of this where there was a grouping, no one could find a synapomorphy for that group, and lo and behold, it turns out that their grouping was artificial or mistaken. So we're going to shift now to what is sort of the opposite of synapomorphy in a way, which is this term homoplasy, which you will also hear a lot of in this class. So before we get into homoplasy, I just want to start with sort of a philosophical thing. If you have a group of organisms and you're looking at their traits, and you document that the traits are similar between, say, four of the ten organisms you're looking at. They all have wings. They all fly with mechanized flight. That, that's, you're not done with studying the evolution of that particular trait. What you need to do is try and distinguish whether or not that trait is similar in those organisms because they are derived from a common ancestor, and the ancestor had that same trait. Or, possibly, they are derived separately in distinct evolutionary lineages. So it could be that the organisms that fly all separately invented flight. And flight was not present in the common ancestor of those organisms. When the trait was present in a common ancestor, that's called homology, shared ancestry. When traits are similar but they originated separately, that's called homoplasy. And the traits in the different organisms are called homoplastic traits if they originated separately, not due to common ancestry. So now to show up, uh, that, you want me to slow down, move on, is that okay? All right, so I'm going to show you a visual example of this first, again with the, the smiley faces, I'm getting sick of the smiley faces, so I made an emotionless, um, bo boring lecturer or something uh, face. We have a change from emotionless to frowny on one branch, and then another change on a different branch from emotionless to frowny. So for this particular group of organisms, for this particular character, the character being the face, we have two separate origins of the frowny face in different branches in this tree. So if we compared A, B, D, E, H, G, and F to each other, they are similar in they have the same character state. 
But their character state did not all originate from a common ancestor. So that is homoplasy. Whenever you have a character state mapping that looks like this, where you have one branch where you had the origin, the change to a particular character state, and then another branch where you had a change to the same character state, that is homoplasy. The process to, so homoplasy is just the existence of traits that are in different groups that originated separately. The process by which homoplasy is created, much of the time, is called convergent evolution. So the shape of sharks and whales, for example. Two different groups of organisms have become very similar in their shape by selection for speed in the water, in essence. And their features have converged to be similar to each other. The same is true for flight. So you've had multiple separate origins of flight in different animals, such as in birds and bats, from flightless ancestors. That is homoplasy. Now things, as I mentioned before, biology is messy. Things get complicated when you look in deep detail at the underlying structures in organisms. So if you compare birds and bats, their flight has origi originated separately and is therefore convergent evolution. However, they have used the same bones, homologous bones, for the underlying structure of their wings. So these bones here and here and here, labeled in the different colors, are homologous between birds and bats. It has been a separate origin of flight but the bones themselves that are used have a common ancestry. So if you're looking at flight, I'll get to you in one second. If you're looking at flight, it's homoplasy and convergent evolution. But if you look at just the bones and you say bone number one in the wing is actually homologous to the same bone in bats. Yeah? How do you know that bones are homologous? They don't the purple ones. I'm not 100% sure how they know in this case, but in many cases what you do is you actually have a much fuller history of bones for the entire group of organisms. And you can show, for example, that in um, the ancestors in particular of bats, which are surrounded by a lot of non-flying organisms, you can see the modifications that occurred in the, the bones in the shoulder that led to this particular structure. So I don't know in this case, but usually having rich sampling of other taxa to figure out the, what those bones are derived from is the best way to do this. And I don't, I don't know in this actual case. Any other questions about that? Okay, so if we showed this on a tree like we've been doing with character state evolution, it would look like this. The red squares are the ability to fly. The blue square, the blue circles are can't fly. So we could say that the character is flight, and the character state is either presence or absence of flight. And we have two, we, we know the history here. We're just assuming we know the history here. We have two separate origins of the presence of flight, which again is homoplasy. So what I'm going to talk about briefly in the last couple of minutes is a little more complex. We're going from the sort of simple models to the more and more complex as we go for the first few days of this class. We're now going to try and figure out the character history for particular character states when we do not know it. So rather than saying that we know what the most recent common ancestor looked like and what was the ancestral state, and where the changes occurred on the tree, and what was the derived state, we're now going to try and figure out from what are called character state reconstruction methods what the pattern of states was in the ancestors for all the taxa that we're looking at. 
So these are called character state reconstruction methods. We are reconstructing the history of those character states in our tree. So for now, we're going to assume we know a tree. We're going to start given a tree. Now we're going to take the characters of modern organisms and try and infer their history on the tree. So let's do that with the bird and bat flight example. What we do is we take our tree, and instead of having labels for all the ancestral nodes and the branches and the character state changes, we know nothing. We just know what we observe in the modern organisms. And now what we do is we test different models for what the character states looked like in the past. And we try and distinguish among those different models, saying which one we think is most probable. What is the most plausible pattern for the character states along the tree? So if we have two character states, present and absent, what we do is we basically say that the nodes in the tree, the most recent common ancestor for each grouping, could have any of the states that we observe in the modern taxa, present or absent. We're not going to make it extra complicated. We're not going to say that there could be another feature in here. Present and absent really is binary anyway. But if we had you know, three-chambered, two-chambered, four-chambered heart, we wouldn't say maybe the ancestor had a 17-chambered heart. We're only going to use the features present in the modern organisms. And now what we're going to do is we're going to test the different possibilities for the ancestral states. So here's one possible pattern. The ancestral state here was can fly. Here it was can't fly. Can't fly, can fly, can fly, can't fly, can't fly. If that was the pattern, we're going to compare that to what if the pattern was all of the ancestors could not fly. Here's a third possible pattern. All of the ancestors could fly. and many, many others. We're not going to test them all here, but in theory you should test all possible ancestral character state patterns. So here are the three patterns I showed you. Pattern one, two, and three now shown just all together at the same time. How do we decide which pattern is the most plausible? Yeah? Pick the simplest one. What is the simplest one? Right, so the, the one that requires the fewest number of changes is, for this purpose here, considered to be the simplest model for character state reconstruction. And that's operating on what's called, thank you for that question, by the way, um, what's called the principle of parsimony. There are a multitude of possible patterns to explain anything we observe. You're walking across the street and you see a tree that has you know, fallen on top of a car you're probably going to do parsimony in your head and assume that the tree fell onto the car rather than the car drove underneath a fallen tree. So that's what we're going to do for character state reconstruction. Just take this principle of parsimony, choosing the simplest explanation if all else is equal. And in this case, the simplest explanation is going to be the one that requires the fewest changes in character states along the tree. So we count character state changes for all of those possible patterns of ancestral character states along the tree. And we count them up to say how many character state changes were there for each of them. And we pick the one or the ones that require the fewest number of changes. So if we go back to these three patterns, again, this isn't all the possible patterns, but if we go back to these three patterns, let's just look at pattern one. Here was the pattern again. How many state changes do we need to generate this tree? Well, we need a change here from can't fly to fly. We need another change here, 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 and here and here. So that's seven character state changes to match what we labeled as the nodes to the tree. 
We do that for the next pattern. Oh, right, so we could have added extra, so I, I didn't have any changes here because it went from can't fly to can't fly. We could have had it go from can't fly to fly and back to can't fly along that branch. That's not parsimonious. So we're not going to use that as our explanation, although that does occur, in fact, in some cases. If we don't know anything about it, we will not assume that things have been that complex. So for this pattern, that requires two character state changes. And for this pattern, that requires six character state changes. So how do we decide among these three options? We pick the one that required the fewest character state changes. And we'll talk about this again on Wednesday and then talk about how we use this to infer what the structure of the tree is too.